Um, I need to do a couple of thank yous before we start. So first, I'd like to thank the Wellcome Trust for continuing to sponsor the event in its changed form. We really appreciate their continued support. I'd also like to extend the biggest thanks I possibly could to Elaine at the BSA for all her help. She's currently the BSA logo somewhere on your screen. Uh, she is extraordinary. She's extraordinary every year and this year has been exceptional. We decided, quite right, yeah, round of applause for Elaine. Uh, we decided really about six weeks ago that we were going to do this and Elaine has pulled it together like an absolute superstar. Um, she is hidden out of view and has muted herself. <laughs> uh, That's not our choice. Very much Elaine's elected to do that. Um, and is making sure that everything runs the time and goes smoothly. So thank you very much. Um, I'd also like to thank the rest of the committee. I know we say this every year, but everyone is a volunteer. Um, this was very last minute. We've all experienced professional and domestic and personal issues relating to COVID-19, as I'm sure have all of you. Um, but nevertheless, they have managed to organise today's event, review a selection of nominated books for the FSHI Book Prize, facilitate mentoring relationships between 70 plus mentors and mentees, and select a winner for the Phil Strong Postgraduate Prize. Um, I'm extraordinarily lucky to work with such an excellent group of people. I um, couldn't be more grateful, and I'm really looking forward to the content of today. Um, that said, it is 9.35, so I'm going to stick to Schedule 2. I'm going to pass over to Sarah now, who is going to chair the first session of today. Thanks very much, all. Super, and I'm really excited that we're going to hear from Graham Martin, Lenny Hannah, and Robert Dingwall, and they're going to tell us um, about the politics of face masks in our contemporary time. So thank you very much, all. And if you could keep all of your questions to the Q and A, um, and then I'll be reviewing them as we go through the talk, and then asking them to our panel um, at the end of their presentation. So thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, uh, Jen, for the introduction and for the invitation. Hopefully people can see uh, the slides on the screen. Robert, I can see your face. Could you nod if you can see them? Great, thank you. So this uh, panel um, was prompted by a paper that the three of us published with Margaret McCartney uh, in Critical Public Health earlier this year on face masks, on the evidence for them and on the debates around them. Um, we'll each be presenting separately, not on the substance of the paper itself, but on uh, various issues that arise and extend from the arguments we, we made there. So I'll be taking five minutes at the start to briefly introduce the background, uh, and then each of us will take about 10 minutes to present our own slides, which are slightly different, but hopefully complementary. And as Sarah says, um, we'll have discussion and questions at the end. There should be a good 15 minutes at least for that, which Sarah will chair. Um, and if you've got questions for any one of us individually or for all of us or just for wider discussion, please uh, do pose them then. So just to give you a little bit of a uh, brief background, COVID-19 itself, of course, hardly needs uh, any introduction. The pandemic was declared in the Europe region by the WHO on the 11th of March, and it's been global in its reach, I think it's fair to say, perhaps more skewed towards the Northern Hemisphere and the Western Hemisphere. Uh, but nevertheless, there's few countries that it hasn't touched. Um, six months into the pandemic, uh, the epidemiology, the sequelae of the uh, disease are becoming clearer, though they're still debated. I think the trajectory from here on in is still very unclear, particularly as we go into the northern hemisphere's winter. But compared to the situation six months ago, I think we do know more about the, uh, the virus and its morbidity and mortality and all the rest of it than we did back then. Back in March, when it was just starting to hit us, the UK went into a lockdown that we're still to some extent affected by today. And there are a range of other public health interventions that came around at that time um, with varying degrees of evidence behind them. So we had a big push towards hand hygiene. Uh, we've had uh, measures around social distancing. Uh, we've had shielding for vulnerable people. And of course, schools have been out not just for summer, but for spring as well, and are only just going back. So each of those measures has been implemented in a different way. Some have been more um, legally enforced than others, and some have got better evidence behind them than others. One of the interventions that came about at that time, or perhaps slightly after the lockdown, was um, the idea of uh, masking or covering your, your nose and your mouth uh, to basically affect source control on the virus, so that people who are infectious but possibly not symptomatic, uh, there is reduced likelihood of them transmitting uh, the virus to others. And there were several papers uh, in the early spring in the medical press that made a strong case that these could be part of or even the key part of the solution to coronavirus um, and for various reasons each of the three of us got interested in this push and we found ourselves concerned by various things including um, the quality of the evidence base behind them 
which at least in ep at an epidemiological level was and probably remains quite limited. There's some mechanical evidence that face masks might work to stop uh, the virus from spreading, but very little evidence that it works at a population level. We were also concerned about the lack of consideration of the possible downsides of face masks in much of this literature. And finally, we were concerned by the way in which these uncertainties were or weren't being communicated um, by scientists to policymakers and the public. And a couple of examples of that at the bottom of the screen, but there are many others, <clears throat> which we think exemplified perhaps an overconfidence in the quality of um, face masks and, and the likelihood that they would make a difference and um, an overconfidence in communicating that message and, a, and an oversimplification of those possible downsides. So the three of us wrote um, a, a paper that we published on a preprint server back in April uh, and we publicised that on Twitter and it created something of a Twitter storm. We had supportive comments, we had critical comments, some legitimate, some less so, and we had our fair share of ad hominem attacks uh, and suggesting that we were acting in bad faith by even raising this argument. Um, we uh, tried not to be put off too much by that and in collaboration with Margaret McCartney, who many of you will know is a GP from Glasgow, has written extensively um, about uh, evidence in medicine and the potential harms of uh, medical and public health measures. We developed the paper further, submitted it to Critical Public Health, and I'm very pleased to say um, that it was published last month, open access in Critical Public Health. Now, as I say, we're not going to focus on regurgitating the arguments from that paper today. So if you do want to read it and cite it, then there's a Q, uh, QR code there, which will take you to it. Very briefly, the two main thrusts of our argument in that paper were first of all around the state of the evidence base for face masks, including their positives and their under-considered negatives. And secondly, um, the way in which science and society have uh, interacted around this and the overconfident messaging, the need for further research, the need to inform a public debate that might be more mature and more intelligent than the one that I think we've had to date. Now I'll be picking up on some of those points in just a minute in my uh, 10 minute session. Before I do so, let me briefly preview uh, the, the presentations that we'll have from my uh, two co-panelists. So after I've spoken, Robert uh, will be talking about the way in which biomedical perspectives have come to dominate so much COVID-19 science, not just face masks, but many other areas as well, and the consequences for other disciplines' contributions and the consequences for what we value and prioritise uh, as a society, the kinds of values that become hegemonic in that process. And then Esme, finally, um, will be presenting preliminary findings from a study that she's leading on the real life experiences of face mask wearing, uh, with a particular focus on some of the groups who we hypothesised in the paper might find particular challenges as face mask wearing has become increasingly legally compelled uh, in much of the UK in some settings. So my um, presentation, if that, that was the background, this is the presentation, and obviously it's seamless the transition between them. But what I really want to focus on is some of the way that the public debate has developed since then. And the backdrop to that is the way that the policy has developed around face masks since we wrote the paper. Uh, so the WHO changed its guidance, its recommendations around face mask wearing, basically reversed them on the 5th of June, suggested that they be used in public spaces. And since then, most of the UK has followed uh, in introducing mandatory um, face mask policy backed up by criminal law in many indoor settings. That's also been the case across much of the rest of the world, and some countries have gone further. So in France, in some cities, um, you're now legally obliged to wear a face mask in, in open air settings, even though there's very limited uh, evidence for transmission outdoors of the virus. There are exceptions as well. So the Nordic countries, well, Sweden and Norway at least, have been much less forceful about face masks as they have about other public health uh, interventions, including the lockdown. And within the UK, as you can see from this timeline, Wales is something of an exception. Face masks are mandatory on public transport in Wales, but not in other indoor settings, except where there have been um, local out, uh, outbreaks, uh, such as in uh, Care Philly. But essentially, we've moved towards um, a situation where much of the world is masks. And alongside those legal developments, there have also been ongoing battles in the court of public opinion. There's been um, an increasing sense that this is the right thing to do. Uh, and that started on the left, I think, of the political spectrum, moved towards the centre ground and towards the mainstream right. We see this very notably uh, in the United States, where the debate around face masks has become caught up in left-right, liberal, conservative politics. And of course, it's been um, a point of contention in the presidential uh, race. 
Um, and of course, everything in the United States is heavily polarized and politicized at the moment. So perhaps it was inevitable that face masks would go the same way. Uh, but we've seen Trump actively make a political issue of it, mocking Biden early on, then seeming to change his mind and, and adopt face mask wearing himself. Not like him to completely contradict himself and change his direction, of course. But it's not just the two presidential hopefuls who have been um, heavily involved in this. I think in the United States, it's become another one of those key fault lines in debates that we see between um, the conservative stroke, the libertarian um, uh, conglomeration on the right versus the liberal progressive conglomeration on the left. And that manifests in all sorts of ways that we see on Twitter and elsewhere. Things like gun control, um, abortion rights, climate change, to some extent, things like healthcare spending, gender politics, vaccination, all of these things are the traditional fault lines and mask wearing uh, it seems to be one of the things that has joined those as, as one of the, the touchstones of those kinds of debates. So we see on places like Twitter, progressives lining up to reinforce pro-masking messages. Ice T there suggesting that wearing a mask, people who refuse to wear a mask in public for whatever re reason are stupid or irrational. Uh, Eminem has co-written a rap about it, decrying people who don't wear masks in public. Twitter itself has even weighed in on this debate, suggesting again, contributing to this notion that mask wearing is something that we should all be doing to protect one another and if you do it then we'll reward you with this much sought after edit uh, key for your for your tweets that's twitter and of course twitter is always like that because you've got 280 characters and it's all about setting up those sometimes artificial oppositions but these kinds of debates can also be found found in longer form outside twitter and outside the united states but they seem to resort to exactly the same kind of tropes, bashing the opposition's side as irrational, as unthinking, almost as cult-like. You can see, for example, in this New Statesman article that many of these kinds of things are invoked about the opposition, uh, that they are, they are just you know, ridiculous, uh, tantruming toddlers with no merit to their arguments whatsoever. And I think the key point to make here, or the key point that I want to make here, is that both sides gain from this opposition. The right speaks to its own echo chamber, the left speaks to its own echo chamber. Progressives make political capital from mocking conservatives. Conservatives make political capital from mocking progressives. They preach to their own choirs and in the process they reproduce and enhance this binary, simplistic, distant, black and white argument. Um, and in the process, the quality of debate suffers. Debates become truncated, positions become polarized, opp opposing views are diminished, points are scored in those culture wars. And the question of mask wearing and its scientific basis and the reasons why we might want to say it's more problematic than simply saying the science says yes, become diminished. And whether you wear a mask, your position on whether masks are a good or a bad thing becomes simply a matter of being a marker on a host of other liberal stroke conservative things. The consequences of this, I think, are not good scientific debate being reduced to a binary opposition between this singular notion of scientific expertise and its irrational anti-enlightenment other means that any, sorry, wrong way, uh, any effort to suggest that there might be more to the debate than this becomes unwelcome. Nuance isn't a thing that these debates value. If you're not on our side, you must be on the other side and that means you're stupid. And because this becomes subsumed within this political bipolar, sometimes partisan, but sometimes left-right progressive conservative division, any effort to identify the political and social trade-offs becomes very easily dismissed. Because why wouldn't you want to do everything you can to save every last life, even if there's very limited evidence that it might make a difference, and even if there are significant downsides to those kinds of measures of the kind that Robert and Esme will both be, be speaking to in due course. Now, as I've said, these kinds of depressing binaries are most evident on Twitter, but I think we see them in the real world too. Uh, we have increasing reports of stigmatization, shaming, victimization, even violence towards people who for legitimate in inverted commas or illegitimate in inverted commas reasons uh, do not wear masks. And of course, there are criminal penalties that have become progressively harsher in the UK and in many other jurisdictions. And this is hugely problematic, particularly for people who are disadvantaged by these measures. Autis autistic people, uh, other neurodiverse people, people with sensory impairments, people who, have, uh, who are socioeconomically disadvantaged, various things that Esme will be speaking to later on. So you have these voices silenced in the debate and it becomes a simple matter of why wouldn't you want to do this thing that probably might benefit on balance most of the population. And that is a rather a crass form of utilitarianism. So what's the alternative? 
Well, the first thing I want to say is that I'm not here calling for a depoliticization of science. I'm not that naive. I'm not suggesting there should be a harder barrier between science and politics, but I do think we need a better interface between science and politics, not least because scientists can't absolve themselves of responsibility for the emergence of these binaries. These overconfident declarations about no-brainer interventions feed the notion that only people who are anti-science or irrational or have some uh, hidden uh, ulterior motive would be against them. So we must be absolutely insistent in resisting the closure of these kinds of debates, especially when we're being told that it's irresponsible even to open them. More broadly, I think we need to take a less exceptionist view of the current situation. Yes, it is unprecedented. Yes, it is exceptional. But that means that many of the usual components of the policymaking process have been suspended or sped up or, or sacrificed altogether. So we have very limited parliamentary scrutiny. We have the Coronavirus Act, which allows really quite severe measures to be uh, introduced with very, very limited parliamentary or public debate. Um, other instruments of you know, civil society, of the civil service have been suspended, impact assessments, we've had very limited public debate around these things. Um, and all of these things are really, really crucial. They're not optionals for a liberal democracy. And I think as sociologists, we have an important contribution to this. And I'd like to conclude with, the, with some suggestions for our conclusion, for, for our in, um, contribution on this final slide. So first of all, and as medical sociologists in particular, we are very well placed to expose, to problematize the understandings that science and medicine has of these issues, the, the assumptions and values that underpins it, and in the process make those, uh, those assumptions debatable. Not to challenge them for its own sake, but to challenge them because it is important to be critical, not to take these values for granted and to think about them and debate them properly. And that's, yeah, as I say, as a particular role for medical sociology. Um, our colleagues in other branches of sociology and in uh, uh, adjacent disciplines such as uh, media studies, criminology, socio-legal studies, also have very important perspectives on and in anticipating and studying the potential downsides of the introduction of measures like this, particularly when they're do, done through social norming, through uh, legal measures, including the full brunt of the criminal law and all the rest of it. So we have really important debate um, contributions to offer to the debate in that. And finally, on, a, on an empirical level, and as Esme will be uh, giving us a taste of in a bit, sociologists are very well placed to identify and study the possible socially uh, unequally distributed consequences of an intervention, like this, particularly how they affect marginalised, seldom heard groups whose voices have not been sufficiently attended to in these debates uh, to date. So I, I think that is the, the, the overarching view of the, the contribution. We might want to discuss that more later. But I think the underpinning point is that, you know, there is a long history in sociology of questioning power structures, including ones that are seemingly benign and for the public good. And we must be unstinting in extending that critical social scientific gaze towards all of these positions, particularly ones which claim that they are uh, speaking for the public interest. That's it from me. Thank you. Robert's next. <laughs> You're muted, Robert. Robert, you're still muted. It's all right. I'm not as familiar with this as with the uh, <clears throat> the unbearable Microsoft Teams that Nottingham Trent insists that we use. Um, so, uh, are you are you picking me up, Graham? Yeah. Okay. So I should start this, I, I think, by making it clear that although I've played various roles within the uh, official governmental scientific advisory process um, in the course of the last six months or so, anything that is said today is a personal view uh, and does not in any way I incriminate uh, nerve tag, sage, meag, uh, or the various bits of the cabinet office uh, and other conversations that I've that I've had. Um, although, of course, all of those things are sitting in the background somewhere. Um, the, the thing that has been of interest to me here has been the, um, the issue of, um, how should we put this, the, the issue of whose knowledge counts about the 
the hierarchy of credibility, as Steve Epstein put it in his uh, study of the relationship between uh, AIDS publics and um, the, uh, the, the scientific community um, in the, uh, the relationship between scientific research uh, and, and civil society um, in relation to HIV. And as somebody who's always been a bit of a skeptic about medical imperialism, um, about the, the apparent revival of uh, biomedical imperialism um, in the course of this pandemic management, what it might mean for uh, the study of medicine, for the study of sociology. Now, I think the point from which we might start is the question of how the pandemic itself has come to be defined whether it's a societal challenge or a public health challenge. One of the things that's striking, uh, that's, that struck me particularly as somebody who was involved in writing the, uh, the original uh, pandemic influenza plan um, was that you know, back in the early 2000s, we envisaged that the pandemic was going to be managed by the cabinet office, reporting uh, directly to the prime minister at the center of government coordinating the, uh, the various government departments and recognizing that this was a cross societal problem. One of the things which has subsequently happened with um, 10 years of austerity, austerity um, the reconstruction and fragmentation of the, the health service under the Lansley reforms, all of the things that have been going on with, with local government and uh, in, uh, similar institutions of civil society is that the the infrastructure that was assumed um, in 2007-2009 uh, has essentially disappeared and the organisa organisational memory disappeared along with us. And when this, the pandemic was war-gamed, uh, as, as the government has it, in 2016, in 2016 this, this was very clearly exposed. The, the fault lines were obvious uh, at that point are documented in the report on that, uh, the internal report on that uh, exercise. Um, you know, you have the accounts of you know, organizations that didn't know they had a part to play in pandemic management. You had organizations that thought they had a part to play but couldn't remember where any of the documents were. Um, you had organizations that you know, suddenly discovered that they were supposed to be plugged into systems and providing things that they had no idea about. Um, and that appears that that weakness was never addressed. Um, now, my impression, and it's no more than that, is that this was because the entire civil service was kind of pivoted to focus on the Brexit agenda, um, and they simply like lacked the institutional capacity to to follow up on these identified weaknesses, uh, and and that's a a familiar problem to people who research on. Um, uh, organizations on institutions disasters the how do you prepare to deal with a low probability high impact event uh, and sustain that focus of attention over a long period of time that you know what had appeared a high risk in 2005 2007 2009 in the wake of the first the original SARS uh, in relation to the 2009 swine flu pandemic um, that these things have, have been forgotten, they hadn't been priorities, you know, whenever resources have been squeezed, this was the sort of thing that fell off the edge of the table. So what's happened in 2020, uh, when all of this came in as an emergency, um, quite rightly, you have the panic of the emergence of a novel infectious disease, and uh, in much the way that Phil Strong wrote about the the panic in response to the appearance of HIV in the 1980s. There's a vacuum and DHSC fill it. Um, and all of a sudden this becomes a public health challenge uh, and, and not a, a societal challenge. And I, it's an interesting question as to sort of why this happens. Uh, I think some of the answers might lie in the the work of Richard Jones and James, James Wilsden on the impact of what they call the biomedical bubble uh, on UK science policy uh, over the last decade or so. You know, the UK is a world leader in biomedical sciences, uh, but this has then led to 
an elite group of biomedical scientists getting a particularly strong lock on uh, science policy. And the assumption that you know, whatever, whatever it is that the biomedical sciences do is appropriate for every other area of science policy, including the social sciences and humanities. And that you know, these are the experts to whom governments should turn um, in, in, in any kind of crisis. So you have this elite network um, very much focused on Oxford, Imperial, UCL, to some extent King's College London, and the social connections of the people in that network. Um, and our, you know, our dear sponsors for the Data Welcome Trust are clearly also part of this. Um, and that is, you know, it's a, I'll say more about the nature of that bubble, but it, its role in the management of this uh, pandemic has been very apparent. You also have, if you like, the, you know, the rhetoric of following the science, which is, again, is, is a fascinating phenomenon for those of us who study um, science and technology. Um, the, if you like, the abdication of politics, uh, that somehow or other, this is a way to, as Graham was saying, to, you know, to depoliticize the, uh, the, the value choices and, and judgments and opportunity costs that, that have been involved. So the turn to the Department of Health for Leadership placed this in, the, in biomedical hands. Uh, you have the coincidence of a chief medical officer and a chief, uh, chief scientific advisor who come from senior but similar backgrounds. Uh, you have SAGE, this ad hoc body. Um, I mean, say, you know, it caused a lot of confusion at the beginning. SAGE is not a standing committee. It's the name for the committee that is created to advise government in whatever emergency is being confronted. So if you're confronting, if you're confronting floods, you assemble SAGE out of environmental scientists, hydrologists, geologists, uh, and, and, and so on. Um, in a health crisis, obviously you turn to biomedicine and allied interests. Um, and one of the features of this and, and the elite connections is what I've called in a blog post, patrician policy making policies being made by people with a very limited life experience. Now by that, I don't necessarily just mean the sort of, you know, Eton PPE, Ox Oxford PPE, et cetera. Um, I, I also, I'm also thinking that the scientific elite bring with them a set of assumptions about the nature of meritocracy. So although STEM subjects have historically been a route for uh, smart working class kids to you know to rise up through the system uh, as Michael Young pointed out way back in the rise of the meritocracy this does be lead to a, a kind of belief that you know the rewards of this are appropriate um, that it is a recognition of individual talent and merit and that um, to some you know that the 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 life circumstances of those who are if you like left behind in a meritocracy are, are in some sense a question of desert, um, things that are, sort of may lie in the past of a scientific leader, um, but which uh, don't necessarily preoccupy them in the present. And we've seen this throughout. I mean, from the very beginning, you know, we've had policies made by people who live in big houses with big gardens and imposed on people who live in houses of multi-occupation with no garden space at all, policies made by people in their 60s or people in their 30s, um, in their 20s and 30s. Um, I mean, we've seen it even even yesterday in the you know the rule of six, which is incredibly discriminatory against certain kinds of social and ethnic groups, where family connections are really important, um, and where uh, and who prefer to live in rather larger households. Um, so that this will have a this rule will have a discriminatory impact not just on sort of obvious groups like South Asians, but also less obvious groups like Orthodox Jewish communities where, you know, the assembly of ex extended family for the Friday night um, <clears throat> eve of Sabbath meal um, is, you know, is, is a very important part of their community life. Um, but, you know, these things are glossed over. They don't enter into the thinking of those, of, of those, kinds, of, uh, those kinds of networks. <clears throat> Um, 
you also see it in, in the, the notion that universities will be told not to send students home. Well, you know, if you're Oxbridge and you're dealing with a largely residential student community, maybe that's an injunction that makes sense. Most of us, I think, work in universities where we can't actually tell the students where to live at all. You know, only a minority of our students will live in accommodation that is controlled by the university. Um, and whatever they choose to do if they get sick is, <clears throat> is really beyond the control and influence of the, of the universities. So you have this, um, you have this kind of uh, characteristic feature of, as, as Graham is pointing to, the, the exclusion of important community voices and the exclusion of the people on whom uh, these policies have impacts. Um, and I suppose I got most involved in this in the debates over the, the so-called two meter rule. Now, why does this matter? Well, basically, uh, it depends on what you create as the sterile zone around a, an individual human. Um, the, <clears throat> the two meter rule sterilizes 12.5 square meters of space. And if it's a one meter rule, it's 3.1 meters. But it's also a kind of nice example about you know, how knowledge gets filtered through this biomedical lens, that you know, the systematic reviews only count the things that are published in Medline, uh, that are indexed in Medline, that the, the knowledge that physics and engineering have about air, about, trans, about trans, the movement of air, about ventilation, um, is, is kind of set to one side. It's not in journals that are searched. Um, to the extent that it enters into biomedicine, it enters in uncritically, so that the problems with experimental evidence, um, you know, the, the videos that you kind of see on BBC television, most of which are, have very little ecological validity. Uh, you know, they, you set up nice experiments which give you easy measurements um, uh, and nice videos, and they, they get published in the journals, um, but actually their application to the real world is intensely problematic. It's a problem we're familiar with as social scientists. Um, it's a problem that the physicists and engineers will recognize themselves, but for the, the biomedical reader of those articles, uh, you know, they are all treated equally. Um, you know, they're not read with the same kind of criticism uh, that might be applied to, uh, you know, to a, 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 a publication in the journal on, on virology or immunology or whatever. Um, but at least that is kind of recognized. I mean, what I find particularly interesting is the utter exclusion of the, the whole knowledge, social science knowledge about social distancing in, in the field known as proxemics, which has been around since the 1950s um, and which is actually now quite a hot area. Sorry, I'll skip through this. But I'll, so just to comment on this, the, um, if you look at the pictures here, <clears throat> figure three is what a real human breathing looks like. And you can see the way in which the air current is pushed upwards by the temperature gradient between a real human body um, and, a, uh, and the environment. So there's a convection current around humans, hot air rises and it carries expiration with it. Um, and you can see below what a cough does, it travels a bit further. If you look to the right at figure six, you'll see that what you've got is an artificial, and it's a simulated cough. Um, so that thermal plume is missing. Um, the expiration is much more directional, much more concentrated. Um, and basically you can tune the mannequin to give you pretty much any, re any results that you like. Um, to move on to the, the field of proxemics, I mean, since the late 1950s, early 1960s, we've had this work founded on the contribution of Edward T. Hall, um, which really points out that you know, humans on the whole do not like to get too close to other humans. Um, you know, the people you get really close to are the people that you're really intimate with, family members, children, romantic partners. Uh, you, get, uh, you, you get to feel distinctly uncomfortable if you're forced closer. Um, and actually, it does raise the question, well, why would we need a two, a two meter rule or a one meter rule at all? Because on, on the whole, humans don't like to get that close to each other. 
Um, it's sort of a field that's been a bit up and down over the, the last 70 years, but actually it's, it is now red hot because of the study of human robot collaboration in workplaces. Basically, we need to be able to tell the robots how much distance to leave between themselves and humans um, in order to that the humans don't feel spooked by the robots. And a lot of that work is done in computer science, um, in the, uh, the interface between computer science and psychology. But the SAGE behavioral psychology setup doesn't provide access to this knowledge and it has no route in to the, to the silo around policy. Um, so just uh, moving quickly, because Graham has already covered some of this ground, um, the consistent findings about the problems of face coverings, um, I'll maybe highlight the way in which, again, the biomedical world has reframed the precautionary principle, which is developed within the social sciences, the socio-legal sciences, as an argument for against precipitate action, you know, that you do not change, you do not intervene, unless you are clear that your intervention is going to produce benefit and does not get, introduce unacceptable levels of harm. And you've got this biomedical reframing as, well, you know, we should do this just in case. It's an argument for action against minimal or theoretical risks. It was quite interesting yesterday listening to Patrick Valance at the press conference where he was talking about, you know, the elaborate precautions that are being taken to ensure that vaccines are safe. Um, and, you know, pharmaceutical trials look as hard for harms, for adverse effects, um, as they do for benefits. But when it comes to social interventions in the present pandemic, nobody cares about this. Um, we don't have that kind of equipoise, which says, you know, we do not do social interventions unless we have looked as hard for the downsides as the upsides. Uh, some or other, you know, social interventions do not have an equivalent status uh, to pharmaceutical interventions. We have the inadmissibility of sociological knowledge, the way in which uh, fear has been constantly reinforced by SAGE uh, on the advice of its behavioral scientists, the way that face coverings come to be a symbol of the risks of going out into the world, the risks of interaction. They're a deter intendedly a deterrent to social interaction. And as sociologists, we should be concerned about what it means for a society based on fear. You also have the, some of the kind of utopian stuff around, well, you know, this is the death of the city and we should all be pleased about that. And that kind of, again, ignores the historic sociological critique of that kind of Ruritanian pastoral uh, deep green vision, um, the way in which cities historically within sociology have been seen as in the important uh, source of dynamism, diversity, challenge, novelty. It's where cities are where futures happen. If we all go back to living in the sort of neighborhood hub vision that uh, some people are promoting, then we have the issue of, well, actually in my neighborhood, looking out the window, if you know, I go down to the local coffee shop, um, all the faces are white. Um, we have a, a slightly more affluent uh, uh, South Asian population gradually moving into the neighborhood, but neighborhoods are not diverse. Um, you know, it's fine if you're a certain kind of professor of psychology who lives in Islington and is quite happy with the thought that, well, maybe you could go to a co-working hub and just sit there with other people like yourself. Uh, for the rest of us, I think we, you know, we might properly point out as sociologists that there's a cost with that. So for some people, it's about power and control, but I don't want to, I think we can overdo the kind of conspiracy theory of medical imperialism. I think it's much more about a kind of cultural attitude. It's much more about uh, you know, what we might think of if we, uh, if, if we take up some of the themes in, in Bourdieu about the kind of habitus, the unquestioning attitude to other forms of knowledge and to other disciplines that haven't been through this biomedical filter. 
Um, and the focus in particular on health as the only possible societal goal, um, what um, Plato calls an iatocracy. Um, and perhaps a, a reasonable note on, on which to conclude is, is, is actually the, the arguments that Plato give, puts into the mouth of Socrates um, uh, against uh, the idea that a, a good society might be run by physicians. Uh, where he says it, look, in the end, there is more to life than health. There is more to society than health. You know, physicians assume that uh, we must pursue this goal of eradicating infection or disease. Uh, they are, as a profession, committed to that kind of moral enterprise. Um, but it's really the job of the politicians uh, to, you know, to hold that in check. The problems we're facing at the moment, if you like, is a weakness of the political process, of the checks and balances, uh, as, as Graham has pointed out, um, that the, uh, like the, the, the voices for other societal goods uh, are going unheard. The, uh, the critique of the uh, unequal impact of the, 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 the way in which the focus on health is, is construed, that that is going unheard. Um, and these, I think, are, are the things that we might properly speak out for. And at that point, I will pass you on to Esme, and we can pick up the debate later. Okay. Okay. Thanks, both Graham um, and Robert, for um, really setting the scene of kind of. Um, where we've come from in relation to face masks, but also um, it's kind of some of the kind of issues and challenges um, that we've faced in relation in relation to those during this pandemic. So I'm going to be talking about the understanding the experiences of face masks based on um, a study that we're currently conducting. Um, so in terms of the picture so far, just to try not to overlap with um, kind of what we've had before, but um, much of that the debates around face masks is really focused on kind of yes or no to face masks, you know, should we use them, should we not, and the kind of very limited evidence that we have around those. And as Graham um, neatly pointed out, that's been very kind of binary, but also polarizing and kind of very unhelpful in many ways, kind of discussion in a kind of fast moving context. Um, despite this kind of the difficulties of these discussions, we see that masks are now mandatory in a variety of settings. Um, and obviously it started with um, public transport moving into healthcare settings, then um, more recently into shops, other um, indoor settings. And now we see discussions around schools as children return to, to the classroom. And those discussions still very much seem to focus on this anti or pro kind of masks, which I would argue really fails to look at the kind of complexity of the overall picture uh, and also of the implications of using masks as an intervention within COVID-19. So the concerns from the outset that we had around face masks um, were across a number of levels. Um, one was around the lack of universality, i.e. who pays for them, um, that we saw in other countries such as France that masks were being provided um, to citizens who were being expected to wear those. We do not see that occurring. There were some um, test pilots, um, Transport for London, for example, were giving them out at the tube stations. But again, that focused on a specific geographical location and particular population group. Um, so there are those issues of, of how do we afford those things um, and what might be the kind of disadvantages um, around those. Um, also, in terms of the affordability um, of using them, so on a social level, um, which links those points around economic disadvantage, but also universality, but also sustainability in terms of the environment. That I'm sure tacitly we've all seen masks discarded on the side of the road. Um, and even those cloth masks that people are, uh, are purchasing, often they only have a 10 to 15 use um, with washes in between um, limit on them. Um, so then we're obviously sending more things to landfill as a result of that. But also concerns around the kind of categorisation of those that might be exempt from wearing masks. So in the government guidance, there's really this kind of homogenous idea of what disability is. Um, that it seems to be this really broad category that anyone that was disabled didn't have to wear a mask with no explanation of what that means. We know as social scientists that um, disability and ability come in various and varied formats um, and that, that 
lumping in large groups of the population with hidden, visible um, and, a, and other disabilities is, is deeply problematic. But also a real concern has been around the lack of evidence being generated during the pandemic around face masks. We have limited evidence to start with, but we see very limited evidence being generated despite the fact that we have this opportunity um, right now. And any discussions about generating evidence has really focused on the problems of it and become very much discussions around, you know, RCTs shouldn't be the gold standard. Um, generating evidence doesn't mean that we should be using RCTs, but we should be using this time and opportunity to generate more information um, around them so that we can move on from that limited evidence base that we've had these endless discussions around. So that limited evidence base was really where we started um, in terms of our study. There's a little poster there of, um, of our advertising that we've done for the study. So the study is currently ongoing. Um, it's a qualitative study and we've been using phone and email interviews. We're using both approaches because um, email interviews may be more accessible to those who may prefer time to process and think about the information that they want to share, but also for those um, who are deaf or have a hearing impairment, using phone may be more problematic. Um, people may also feel more anxious around using um, a phone, um, so we want it to be as inclusive as possible and those two ways have seemed have proven we feel to be really useful in terms of generating um, the evidence within our study. We're using a narrative approach, um, so asking one broad question about people's experiences of using face masks, and in doing that we focused on what really matters to each participant and allowed them to share what are the important things for them. So we have some limited um, kind of follow-ups, but we focus on this broad question and allow them to really share um, what they feel is important. We'll ultimately be analysing that data using reflexive thematic analysis when we get to that point, but we're still in the data generation phase. Um, we currently have um, 13 completed email interviews and 21 completed phone interviews, um, and we have um, six other participants that are currently participating in the study, so taking us up to a nice round number of 40, um, which we feel is really great given the short amount of time that the study's been running. We've also got a really diverse sample in terms of socioeconomic status, geographical locations, ethnicity, different health conditions and differing learning differences. And we've been really um, keen to focus on um, the aspects that might be important to, to different groups and trying to ensure that we're encouraging um, participation that's useful um, in terms of the data that we might ultimately get from that. So I'm just going to rattle through some of our emerging findings. Um, as I say, we're still in the in the phase of um, doing the data generation. So a lot of this is primarily come from some preliminary analysis of the email interviews. So the kind of emerging findings so far are that there are lots of lots of different anxieties and worries, particularly from those who are exempt from wearing masks. Um, those anxiety and worries may focus around how the impact that other people may feel about them not wearing a face mask, um, the feeling of being stigmatized. Um, the worry about if people are going to ask them questions, having uh, witnessed other people um, starting arguments in, in supermarkets or shops. Um, and that links to this di difficulty that people are then finding in terms of having to publicly disclose health conditions um, that they may not otherwise have had to have to do so in ordinary normal life circumstances, um, that they're having to explain why they're not wearing a face mask or face covering um, and in doing so having to disclose what can often be quite personal and sensitive information um, that may not be understood by everybody that they're having to do that. And that might have to be done repeatedly um, depending on what settings they're going into. Um, lots of people feel as they've, they've had a lack of kind of information and support, but both about the use of masks, but also around exemptions. Sometimes that use might be around when there are particular um, particular health conditions, and you know, should you still wear a face mask if you've got a tracheotomy, for example? Um, but also around how can you best convey that you're exempt without having to get into those issues of um, disclosure and how to do that quickly and conveniently. Um, there's been quite a lot of unimagined consequences that participants have reported so for example difficulties with walking while wearing face coverings um, this has been something that's been raised with both those that may be wearing prosthetics but also for those who might have balance issues so when people need to be able to see their feet to know where they're placing either a prosthetic leg or if they've got balance issues um, and people didn't didn't envisage those things happening they're not necessarily huge problems in terms of um, their usage of a face covering or face mask but they are things that weren't kind of anticipated and it's important that we understand what those unintended consequences are and the difficulties that particular groups might have and unless we do research about these things how do we know these things 
Um, lots of participants have talked about the cost implications. This has had a real impact for some people, um, both on their usage of face coverings and reuse, so perhaps limiting them their ability to, to go out, um, and particularly if that's around leisure or social activities, but also people reporting that they're um, having to reuse disposable um, face coverings more than once um, because of the prohibitive cost of them. Um, and if disposable face coverings are kind of easier to purchase at a, a low cost um, than uh, cloth or reusable ones. Um, and we anticipated in our previous uh, papers on this that the kind of making of face coverings might be something that's um, able to be done by a particular group of people but not by everybody and the resource implications around those things. Um, so we do see that masks are not necessarily being used properly in terms of being only used once. Uh, lots of people have talked about restrictions and reductions of activities that often primarily relates to those anxieties and the stigma that they experience from not wearing a mask if they're exempt. Um, and kind of the worries they might have about that or if they face difficulties in wearing a mask they want to be able to wear them but actually find that it's too problematic and so actually might just restrict their their activities in terms of that it's important to note that not all the responses are negative this isn't um, a study that's looking at what are the um the the problems of face coverings solely but it's about people's experiences many people are really trying to adhere to the use of face coverings despite it creating real physical, emotional, practical difficulties for them. Um, and many participants said, you know, I really want to be able to do this. I don't know how best to, to be able to do that because of these issues that I'm facing um, in relation to that. So it's really, it's really important to note that participants are really keen to try and follow the guidance. They want to avoid the kind of anxiety and worry and stigma that might uh, occur if they're not able to wear the face covering. Um, but they're often lacking support and information about how to how to overcome those issues. And lots of these things haven't been mitigated for um, in government guidance. I won't read through all these quotes, but these three quotes um, from participants in the study really kind of illuminate those issues of around the inequalities around the finances and the lack of universal provision. But also the, the impact on um, people's mental well-being in terms of feeling um, segregated and isolated from um, social activities and, um, and from going out and interacting um, as they would normally under normal circumstances. Um, and this participant in the middle suggests that they feel like they're still under lockdown because they're having to restrict what they do because of the difficulties with people understanding why they're not wearing a face covering. Um, and the final participant, this really uh, exemplifies this issue of um, disclosure and the issues with having to, to, to constantly present um, the disability um, to people that they wouldn't normally have to share. So um, people are now perhaps wearing badges that say, I need to lip read, can you take your mask off? And in doing that, you're having to disclose that you're hard of hearing or deaf. Um, and those are really three of the really big issues around those inequalities, um, the impact on people's well-being, and that, that the way in which we talk about and narratives around disability in society more broadly. So just to wrap up, um, the concerns that we raised early in the debate about face coverings were very much trivialized um, and seem to be straw man arguments. Um, a, a quote from an, uh, an early preprint by Trish Greenhouse suggested that whilst academic sparring can keep a few sociologists amused during lockdown, we need to remember our moral accountability to a society in crisis. And our raising of these um, socio-cultural factors around face coverings were really seen as something that were keeping us amused um, as light entertainment rather than we were raising serious issues um, around the intervention um, of face coverings and things that should have been explored before the intervention was was rolled out. Um, we feel that good robust qualitative inquiry that focuses on experiences um, has really been able to show us that they were indeed valid considerations um, and we really must learn from this pandemic and specifically about not leaving behind those who may be further marginalized by health interventions. And if face masks are gonna to continue to be part of our societal responses and we see that they're being rolled out more widely, such as in schools, then we must ensure that we find solutions to the real problems that they can create so that we're not leaving behind um, particular groups within these public health interventions. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Thank you so much to our three panellists and I'm super aware of time so I'm going to recommend that our panellists look at the Q&A and chat um, and respond separately to the questions. We've got some really interesting ones. Um, Stephen asked about um, whether mask wearing increases infection um, and then we've got separate 
Janice has asked a question about um, the experiences of those who are positioned into policing face masks and um, a question about scientific uncertainty and how communicating that is compatible with clear public health messaging. So it's clear we've got lots of questions that your um, presentations have generated that would be really good um, if you could uh, answer um, perhaps just via the chat so we can keep to time. In the meantime, though, I'd like to say thank you very much to all three of you for some really stimulating um, presentations that I think have kicked off our virtual medstock in a wonderful way. So thank you very much for giving up your time and for sharing your insight with us. We really appreciate it. Um, we'll have a minute break and then we'll be starting off um, with our SHI panel. So a minute to run, grab your cup of tea, go to the loo, whatever things you need to do. We're back. Um, it is 10.30, so, which means we are on to our second talk of the day. Um, and I am so delighted that we will be hearing from the joint editors of the journal Sociology of Health and Illness. Um, so that's Liz Henwood and Karen Lawson. And they'll be telling us um, about the journal, how you want how to get published, um, how to peer review, any of the questions that you've got. Um, we plan that this is going to be a really interactive session. Um, so Karen and Fliss will give a short presentation with heaps of opportunities um, to ask questions and to have those burning issues answered. Um, as before, if you can put your questions in the Q&A and we'll get through as many as possible and Shadrick will be chairing those, uh, uh, that Q&A session. So over to you, uh, Karen and Fliss, and thank you very much. Thanks, Sarah, um, and hi, everyone. Um, we've just got a quite a short presentation with an overview of the journal, so I'm just going to hopefully be able to share my screen. And uh, is that coming up OK on your screen first? Yeah, perfect. OK. Um, Okay, sorry. Just trying to... So what, what we would hope to cover in this session is to introduce ourselves and go through the types of papers that we accept for publication in SHI, talk a little bit about the overview of how we get from submitted articles through to the published piece, um, talk, more, talk more about the role of authors, reviewers and the editorial team, and um, really just to encourage you to ask questions and answers, whether that's from an author or reviewer perspective. So the aims and the scope of SHI, it's an international journal. Uh, we publish sociological articles on all aspects of health, illness, medicine, and healthcare. Um, really, the emphasis is on sociology, um, the development of theories and concepts uh, related to the, the topic at hand. We accept empirical work, theoretical work, a combination of those um, in the form of original research reports or review articles. So our team consists of uh, me and Fliss, who's also on this panel as joint editors in chief. And then uh, the wider editorial team is split between Sussex University and Brighton University. Uh, so we have Catherine, Ben, Catherine, Jill and Sasha and we also have Sarah David who is our managing editor who is really the brains of the operation behind the scene um, getting everything in line to get everything published just as we would wish it. We accept original articles of up to 8,000 words and that includes all references um, and related material that's, that will um, ultimately be in the published article. We try to spot where we have related articles coming up in advance and where possible we put those into a special section in the journal um, and promote uh, that section to, to the MedSoc community. 
We also accept review articles, which are, again, 8,000 words long. Sasha Scambler is um, the editor responsible for review articles. So if any, anyone has an idea of an article that they would like to write, please contact Sasha in the first instance. We also um, accept research notes, which are two and a half thousand words long. These are a review of the current um, topic as it stands, and then um, a focus on how this, how this um, topic needs to be researched in, in perhaps particular ways. So they often touch on things that are quite current, um, but may have not been uh, receiving any uh, sociological attention um, for, for, a new, for, for a number of years, sorry. We've also started um, accepting commentaries. Um, these are by invitation only um, at the moment. We have um, a virtual special issue coming up on COVID-19, also one on Black Lives Matter, where we have invited certain um, people who have already published in that area um, to comment on the state of uh, the, the area um, as it is now. Every year we also issue a call for monograph proposals. Um, we have just published our monograph which is on our website and we have just closed the call for abstracts for the upcoming monograph. Um, we've moved slightly away from um, calling for proposals in general to thinking about particular uh, topics or themes or areas that we would like to see covered. So um, in future we hope to have the monograph and perhaps some special issues alongside that. Our impact factor continues to increase. Uh, our latest one is 2.317. Alongside that we're seeing quite a significant increase in the number of original submissions um, that we are receiving. So in the year just finished, we had 521 compared to 409. Our acceptance rate is currently around 21%. That's down slightly from the same time last year. And we can talk about um, why so many papers get rejected um, later on. We're really working on speeding up the time it takes uh, for an accepted paper to actually appear as a printed publication. Um, that currently stands at five months, although when your paper is accepted and the proofs um, are in, um, the paper becomes early online as, as soon as that's ready. So that will be m um, quite a while before the, the print publication. We've got a new e-proofing platform, which is speeding up the turnaround of proofs. So um, getting everything through the system much more quickly. Um, and just last week, we've um, started on a new journal design, which you should see um, appearing quite soon, um, which will again uh, speed up the time to publication and improve uh, your experience of reading the articles. So how, how we work is that uh, Sarah David, who is our managing editor, checks all submitted papers. So for example, are they written in English? Are they suitably anonymized? Um, anonymizing a paper isn't just removing uh, details of authors, it's also removing things like uh, references to grant funding body um, and reference number or um, ethics committee um, reference number, anything where um, a reviewer could potentially get online and find out exactly uh, who is who has been submitting those papers. If everything's okay, Sarah allocates um, half to me and half to Fliss, and at that point we can choose to desk reject. Um, most usually that's because the article doesn't meet the aims and the scope of the journal. Um, if we feel that it does, we will assign the paper to one of our editorial team, which uh, obviously includes ourselves. And that editor will see the paper through from the submission point right the way through to acceptance or rejection. 
We have a large reviewer database, the editors select and we invite suitable reviewers from that database. Uh, when we receive those reviews, uh, we obviously read through them and make a recommendation um, to the author via me or Fliss um, as joint editor editors in chief. Authors are obviously central uh, to this process. As I've said, many desk rejects desk rejects happen because they are outside the aims and the scope of the journal. Um, sometimes papers are just far too short to do justice to the topic. Uh, sometimes papers are just far too long and need to be sent back to be um, reduced in word count before we can really send to a reviewer. Um, another reason I think why we desk reject quite a lot is that papers can be too descriptive uh, without actually moving on the field of, of medical sociology, of sociology of health and illness. And that's what we're really looking to do um, with the published work in SHI. Quite recently, we've um, added in the ability for authors to suggest potential reviewers um, for their paper wherever possible. Um, we don't guarantee that we will use those reviewers, but often um, these suggestions are very useful for us um, in gaining the reviews that we need. Reviewers are also really central to the process. They obviously offer expert feedback on the submissions. We ask reviewers um, wherever possible to review revised versions of the paper, um, especially if um, significant revisions have been asked for. Uh, the paper will be sent back to the reviewers. If the reviews requested are quite minor or the paper has already gone through one review, then the editorial team would um, make a decision um, in-house, if you like, without um, consistently sending it out to reviewers. We need reviewers to communicate honestly with authors and editors. Um, very rarely uh, but it happens, we'll have a reviewer who suggests one thing in the comment to editors and another thing in the comment to authors. And that can, that can um, create quite significant problems um, when we're trying to get reviews back to authors. It obviously really helps us if reviewers are detailed and constructive in their comments to authors. And I think I'm proud that SHR reviewers um, very, very rarely write anything in their um, comments that we we need to edit that you know would be offensive to an author so thank you everybody who reviews for us um, for that confidential comments to the editor are important um, and it, we will look at those comments in making our decision uh, whether to uh, recommend acceptance or rejection so that was a real whistle stop tour um, about uh, SHI and really this session is to take questions and answers um, from participants. Unless Fliss, you would like to add anything. Thanks Karen, I think that's what we wanted to sort of just open with really and then um, I've, I've sort of got some prompts to the audience if the audience doesn't have questions just because I don't like silence. Thank you. Well, I do like silence, but not in this context. Shadrach, are you monitoring the Q and A or anything? Or how yes, does it yeah. work? Yes, I am. Oh, okay. Okay, there brilliant. Are no questions at the moment. I was just okay. waiting if anybody has a question. Maybe as I wait for a question, I can ask one myself, can I? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, um, some journals are moving towards away from anonymous reviewing. Um, I know Fleece and I, we've had that conversation before, but I wondered whether this would be a useful space to talk about that. Where does SHI stand on this, uh, moving away from anonymous reviews and making reviewing much more open and accessible? That's a conversation that we're right in the middle of now. And in fact, I believe there is a poll being taken during virtual MedSoc, not exactly sure by what process. Um, Wiley's Twitter. leading. Yeah, it's going to be. Wiley's it's leading. Oh, it's on Twitter. Yeah, sorry. Wiley's leading that. 
um, precisely to find out what the community in general feels about transparency and um, review process because we don't want to just go into it you know everybody's doing it let's do it let's kind of you know take the community with us if we're going to do it or at least look at some of the potential pitfalls and things before we take that step but definitely considering it yeah because there are definite benefits to having reviewing is an awful lot of work and we really you know realize that i mean but reviewers ourselves but also seeing the amount of effort that people put into giving such constructive reviews which definitely help improve the quality of papers which is good for everybody because then the impact factor goes up and it's just a virtuous circle um, so in some ways it seems you know a, a positive step to have those reviews uh, or reviewers um, able to say yes you know I did this um, um, and um, you know I contributed to to the overall quality of the paper I think if we're honest papers are uh, very much a collective process even if you are a single author um, because of the nature of peer review so I think it's a very interesting area and we'd love to get people kind of joining in the debate a little bit um, through the Twitter poll. Or here now, if anyone has any comments about um, open peer review, whether you would like to be named in your, your review, we'd be interested in hearing your comments. Thanks both. Um, there's uh, a question well, here from Rose. Oh yeah. There's, there's a Robert, question from... Yeah, sorry, Robert has... Um, put in the chat that personally he refuses all review requests from journals that run open peer review. Um, Does he want to say why? Um, that might be interesting to kick things off. Yeah, I mean, I'm quite happy to say why. I mean, the, um, I mean, basically, I, I, uh, I can't come onto video, but um, <clears throat> I mean, but, but, but basically, I, I suppose I regard this as a, as, as a prof Oh, I'm now asked to start my video. <laughs> um, basically, I regard this as a, if, if you like, a, an appropriate professional service uh, for which I'm not particularly seeking recognition or reward, um, and, but where I want to be free to be, as we're absolutely candid, um, without fear or favour of consequence. Now, it doesn't make a big deal for me at my time of life. Um, but it, I think it is a potential constraint if you're asking, uh, and some of the, when I was editing, I mean, some of the best reviews we got came from people who were relatively early in their careers. And, and I'm well aware from feedback in the STEM community uh, that people in that position feel seriously inhibited uh, for, from the, fear, you know, the anxiety about compromising their career prospects by uh, being absolutely candid about what they think of papers from established authors. Um, and I mean, they're double, I mean, interestingly, double blind appears to be uncommon outside some of the social science communities, which I, I, I find very, very interesting, very curious. And there's an ST, there are no doubt STS papers be written about it. Um, but basically, I just think anonymous peer review gives me the freedom to say exactly what I think about the strengths and the weaknesses, you know, without fear of comeback. And, you know, if editors don't like it or editors think the tone is inappropriate or whatever, I'm quite happy for editors to, you know, you know to edit, you know, that's what they, that's what they're there for. Um, you know, I've always tried to be constructive in, and, and moderate in the language. Um, but I, I don't think that the, I don't, I don't, I think transparency tends to lead towards bland reviews. Um, which are not particularly helpful to anybody um, and which I, I suspect actually make the editor's life a great deal more difficult because you, you get a lot more reports that say well you know on the one hand on the other and this might and that might and um, you know you're, you're left with the dilemma of as editor of well what the hell do you do with this mm -hmm. you know it hasn't actually given you a clear steer in either direction but you know that's my view and I appreciate that there are parts of the world where People hold different views, uh, which is fine. But you know, when the BMJ come knocking at my door, they get turned away. Mm. Thanks. I think okay. that's it's really great that you what you said, Robert's really um, exactly the sort of debate we want to to get going. And and as I say, not just go forward. Yeah. There are so many potential losses involved as well as gains from going straight into transparent peer review. 
All right, I have a question here from Ross Williams. Ross wants to know what um, um, the, the uh, general has done. You, you, we have put online or oh, on the web page that we are collecting papers on race and ethnicity articles that we made open access in response to the Black Lives Matter act, um, activity in recent months, um, which I thought was great. On the website, you mentioned the Ed Board is also working on initiatives to support submissions on race related topics from colleagues of color. Is there any further detail on these potential initiatives or are there any, um, is there any way that we can, we as a community can help to do this important work? Yeah, no, I think that's a really good question. Thank you, Roz. Um, it sounds a bit of a get out. We are having our board meeting at 1.30 today and we are discussing more about that. We have a, a couple of proposals where um, whereby we can um, continue to support um, more authors of, of colour actually being involved in SHI um, in various roles. So I won't give any definitive answer at the minute, but hopefully we will have some news that we can um, tweet about um, or, or put on our website um, about those further initiatives. Um, and, and thank you that, you know, we're really grateful for community support and community involvement because it is very much our journal um, and we will be um, very grateful for all support um, from the community. Good. Uh, thank you, uh, Karen. Fleece, did you want to say something about that? Or? Uh, well, support what Karen said. I mean, we've, we've just done a couple of initiatives at the moment. One was to make all papers, uh, as Ros pointed out, all papers that touched on race and ethnicity issues available um, immediately and free of charge. That was sort of as the Black Lives Matter um, uh, got reignited, um, really importantly. And then we also wrote to everybody um, who had written in this field before and said, would you like to, you know, do a sort of state of the art piece as a commentary on article and we're collecting those together now for a special section but then there's this other initiative around actually how to engage and wanting to engage um, more um, um, people um, uh, BAME members to sort of join and, and promote and help um, steer our journal um, in the right direction. Fantastic, thank you both. Um, another question here from Amy Midamis. Uh, Amy wants to know more about reviewing. Um, as a PhD student, she'd like to know more about how it works from the reviewer and the reviewed, but also points out to the earlier question about open reviews, that I will find it hard to be critical of senior academics. Yeah. But I thought you could, you'd like to answer her first, yeah. uh, the first part of the And just um, Gareth's comment has gone. This is one, one way around it, around whether you identify yourself as a reviewer or not, is perhaps to give reviewers the option to name themselves in their review. And that would be a clear steer to the editor that, you know, they would want um, to be acknowledged. Um, that discussion will continue, but that seems to me a, a good compromise. Um, talking about the process of reviewing, um, what happens is when an author submits their paper, um, they choose keywords that really sum up what the paper is in essence about. Um, the editor will then obviously read the paper um, and search for reviewers based on the keywords, um, it might be that you cite um, a certain author in your paper that we feel actually that would be a really good person to review the paper. Um, we need at least two reviews. So we identify the reviewers from our database. Um, we ask that they review the paper. Uh, another kind of endless discussion it's around how long we give reviewers to review a paper. Um, the author obviously wants to have the paper, um, you know, revised, accepted, published in a reasonable time. Um, but obviously reviewers are busy with their everyday workload and lives. So um, we really appreciate if a reviewer can't review a paper that they just reject straight away, uh, reject the request, uh, decline, sorry, decline straight away. Um, so that the editor can move on and find a different reviewer. Um, 
So the reviewer doesn't know who the author is because it, the paper has been anonymized. Um, they are looking really to provide the editors with a critique of that paper. So um, what are its strengths? What are its weaknesses? For example, is it missing a whole body of literature? Is it basically replicating what's already been published? Um, are there elements of the paper that could be developed more? Um, you know, so is the author kind of underselling the significance of their work or anything really a reviewer in that field um, would um, recommend to, to improve the paper or the reviewer might feel well actually this, this just isn't up to the standard, um, perhaps it has really fatal flaws. All of that is fed back to the editor. Um, the confidential comments to the editor is might be something um, it's hard to hard to think off the top of my head. Um, Some, sorry. Sometimes, yeah. Karen. Sometimes I know that sometimes the confidential edit, uh, things to the editor might be. You know, I was really sitting on the fence on this one because you know it, these are the strengths, these are weaknesses. Um, I probably would reject but if you guys as editors can see something that I might have missed, you know, that sort of thing, or people talk about their confidence in assessing different parts of the paper. So they say, you know, I'm very familiar with the general area, but not familiar with this particular methodology. So they're letting us know that that part of the review might not be as strong and shouldn't lead us as much as perhaps other parts of the review. So that's really helpful kind of nuance, which we can get through the um, confidential notes to editors. Yeah. Thanks, Liz. And so then it's the editor's job looking at those reviews and obviously reading the paper to work out what recommendations should be given to the author. So that might be reject, it might be revise and resubmit. So we're interested, but we don't feel it's up to a publishable standard just yet. Or it might be accept with some minor changes. There might be a couple of ideas that really wouldn't take the author long um, to consider. Um, and so they're, they're the kind of decisions that we, we make. Um, so I've just seen in the chat a comment from Alison Druitt to, to ask if you have a review who rejects and the second reviewer is hard to find, takes a long time to review back with delays, do you ever then reject the paper on the basis of one review? Yes, but it's rare. Um, there have been occasions where we, we've tried countless reviewers and nobody is available or willing to review. If we have a review back that, su that suggests reject, um, the editor or one person in the team or one of the board members would act as the second reviewer um, and then the editor could make that decision. So we, we wouldn't just reject on one review but we would um, take a review from the board or from the editorial team and make the decision from there. Um, so I'm not sure, Amy, if that answers all of your all of your question. Um, we ask reviewers to review a revised paper if the first reviews have asked for some significant changes. We do hope to send it back to the original reviewers. Um, to see if they're satisfied with the changes that have been made. If it's just minor changes, um, you know, insert a paragraph about X, Y, Z, then we would check that that's um, been done satisfactor satisfactorily ourselves and make the decision from there. Please. Yeah, one, sorry, can I just add to that, yes. Shadrach? Is that all right? Sorry. Yes, that's fine. One, one difficulty we face sometimes is when we're looking at a revised paper and one of the original reviewers um, declines to review again. Obviously, all sorts of reasons from poor health to, to don't, don't feel like it, I guess. But, you know, that can be really problematic for us and getting that across to that reviewer and saying, you know, if it's at all possible, could you do that? Because it's fairer to the author. If we have to go to a new reviewer for a revised paper, there's going to be a whole lot of other comments um, for the author to potentially have to deal with. So wherever possible, if you're thinking of being a reviewer or you are a reviewer, if you can review the revised paper, you know, that it's massively helpful to the editors, but also to, uh, fairer to, to the authors. So I just wanted to say that because that mm -hmm. does happen. Um, not, 
a lot, but it, it does happen and it takes significant amount of everyone's time uh, then to move the paper on through. Thank you both. Uh, Amy said that was really great. Um, uh, that was helpful. Rebecca wants to know what about where reviewers contradict each other? <laughs> what, what do you do? Sometimes it feels like reviewers are always contradicting each other. <laughs> um, no, that, that's an unfair comment. I think um, when you read reviewers' comments, you can generally see um, that they're, they're kind of thinking the same thing about the paper. Uh, very rarely one will say this is completely unpublishable and the other one says this is perfect, you need to publish it. That, that's really rare. Um, as Fliss said, sometimes in the comments to editor we'll have a reviewer saying you know I'm not sure whether this is reject or revise and resubmit and remember that reviewers reviews are really just guidance for the editorial team um, so the editor does play a significant part in actually reading the paper reading the reviews thinking about you know is this moving the field on is this a good fit for the journal uh, what would the readership make of the paper? If reviews are really, really split, we, um, we can go to a third reviewer. Um, we try not to because we're mindful of the time that, that is taken by that. But if we're really, really unsure what to do, we, we have the option of the third reviewer. I've certainly done that once or twice and it's mainly been for methodological expertise where for some reason I haven't been able to get that the first time around and then I trawled again until I found someone who you know knows exactly how that methodology works and can make an assessment about how well that's been executed in, in that particular paper. But for the reasons Karen said, we try not to do that because it slows everything down and that can be very frustrating for authors. Great, any other question from anybody? I seem to have run out of questions on the Q&A panel. Um, on my screen, if there's any question, or in the meantime, if you've got anything else you wanted to say. I wondered, I mean, if I'm allowed to ask the audience, it's hard for me to see, are there really 74 participants out there? Yes, they are. <laughs> okay. Oh, hi, everybody. It would be lovely to see people. It, it, you know, just miss, miss that so much, I can't say. Oh, but, there is um, a question I, that's come up, please. Sorry, oh good, okay. Um, there is, from an anonymous attendee, medical sociologists, those doing work relevant to the field are, are working across disciplinary or epistemological boundaries. The wider projects from which, from, from which MedSoc work may originate often, often have an explicitly health service research type focus and MedSocs may have to do additional work to cover niche. I'm not so sure whether this is a comment or a question. I can't get where the comment is. So it seems that articles of this type are more likely to invite a desk rejection rather than real um, r and &R. However, I can't see the question. Can you read that? Um, what do, does the panel think when you read that? I, I think um, it's talking about the difficulty of working on health service research projects and trying to carve a niche for a sociological contribution and how it might be useful to have a revise and reject type response with a greater focus on how there could be a medical sociology contribution um, and that could provide the stimulus that people need to carve a niche within their groups um, rather than saying well I tried to put it into this journal and it, and it got rejected. I'm not sure I quite understand. I think the difficulty for us, I, as I understand the, the comment, it's if someone submits a very HSR focused paper, could they not have a revise and submit based on reviewers letting them know where the medical sociological contribution could be developed? Is that, is that right? I think the problem for us is that we do depend on the goodwill of reviewers and I think it's for me I'm not sure if I would want to say to a reviewer this isn't necessarily a medical sociology focused paper at the moment but could you tell them how it can be I think that that mm, I'd need to, to spend time thinking about that please do you 
it, it, I was just going to say it's it's not it's uh, it's not really hundred percent clear cut um, as you can imagine. So to some extent that happens anyway. Uh, uh, you know that that we have to spot some sociological content, but then the, uh, in order to um, send for out for review, um, and then um, the reviewers do absolutely help sort of focus that paper. And, and steer it towards one debate rather than another, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but if there's absolutely zero um, hint of sociological um, insight or awareness of sociological debates and things like that, it's it's really just not fair on, um, or given our remit, I should say, um, on all those other papers that are already engaged in sociology and desperate to publish uh, in SHI. So it's it's a tough call but i think we're as fair as we can be given that it's not i was going to say a perfect science but we know science isn't perfect so that's a silly comment there is a follow-up to that do you publish both qualitative and quantitative studies or do you seek reviews based on method as well as subject specialty sometimes qualitative papers can be considered not scientific enough by a quant specialist in the same topic. Yeah, we what definitely publish. Sorry, we definitely publish quant and qual. Um, much more qualitative. We receive many more qualitative uh, papers than quant, but we do publish quant, and we have um, make sure that we have a member uh, on the team and within the wider editorial board um, who are uh, experts in quantitative methods. So we can sort of make sure that they got the paper a quant paper has the right sort of editor who understands the quant and similarly with reviewers um, because we can search by the sort of methodological expertise as well we can make sure if it's a quant paper and we're editing that paper we can make sure that it it gets an appropriate um reviewer although you know it can take time uh, to find reviewers for quantitative papers i think that's fair to say isn't it karen yeah, yeah i think it is yeah I think the field as a whole, as we know, or some of us may be aware, is is much more qualitative. Um, Mike, people... hope that hopefully that was okay. Uh, yeah. Hopefully that was satisfactory. Can you come back to us if you've got any more questions? Um, there's another quick comment or question, I think, from Gareth. Um, Talks about, thanks Robert for that, I appreciate the sentiment that has been taken. I'm not so sure whether this is a follow-up to the previous conversation on anonymous reviewing. Yeah, I think uh, it is. Uh, and the, this should definitely remain an option. So he's talking about keeping the optionality, whether you can be an open reviewer or an anonymous reviewer on the journal. I've had and experienced occasions where colleagues receive really prompt and wonderful reviews and would like to personally thank the reviewer, especially when provided at a difficult time or they would like to open a dialogue with the author. So opening the option either way might be a happy compromise. I think that was a comment. Yeah, I think option, options are good. Um, um, and that thing about thanking reviewers, you know, you often see it, and I've done it myself, where you, in your acknowledgements at the end of a paper, you thank the anonymous reviewers. So they will know who they are when they see it published. <laughs> so they'll get the thanks. But um, so, you know, it's not necessary. You have to do transparent review to, to, to thank um, the reviewer but yeah i think it's good to well i don't think we would go down a path would we karen where we we said that everybody had to become transparent no i mean i think, I think the proposal is only for us to consider it as an option that's my understanding and as i say we're in the consideration phase <laughs> yeah yeah i don't seem to have any questions uh, on the list or on the chat? I think on the chat, Amy Middlemiss says, how do people get involved in reviewing? Um, okay. If you, if you email Sarah David, her email address is on the SHI Journal website um, with, with your kind of details of your um, topic expertise or your methodological expertise. Um, and then Sarah can add you to the reviewer database. We have started an initiative where um, we're adding um, kind of new and early career research reviewers to and identifying them on the database so that we can 
um, kind of involve them a lot more. Uh, the database is huge and we're just trying to keep track of where, you know, people are quite new to it um, so that we can allocate them papers fairly early on rather than them thinking that we've forgotten about them. Thanks, Karen. Uh, there's a question here from Sarah. Sarah wants to know how theoretical do papers have to be? So I think I've always been a little intimidated from writing from it for SHI because of this. They don't, uh, I think the key thing is we don't, we don't want papers to just describe what they found. You know, we want the papers to move the field on in some way. You know, it doesn't have to be, well, I don't know, I don't know. Um, you move a pay, you move the field on in many different ways. You know, it might be methodological. It might be um, something quite nuanced uh, within an established theory or way of thinking. It it just needs to make a contribution to how that topic has been conceptualised theoretically. Would you? Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, it's it, it's an almost impossible question to answer, but I think that. What I always look for is to see, you know, to what debate within the sociology of health and illness is this paper addressing itself? That that would be sort of one way in which I try to establish whether it's going to go forward, um, you know, be assigned an editor and so on. You know, is it clear? Is the author clear? Um, and if 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 there isn't yet a debate and they're establish, trying to establish a debate, well, that's also relevant because that makes it original. So it's it's about sort of. Um, being really clear about why why it's important rather than just dropping something in here's what I did and 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 then you know we're going but why did you do it who's reading it who who do you want to respond why is it important it's it's thinking about it like that that really makes a difference and making those things explicit in the abstract in the introduction in the conclusion can make a massive difference to a paper actually and good reviewers will, will say that if, if it gets as far as review, but sometimes it doesn't get as far as review because it is just presented as a, this is a study I did, and it's something about health, so it must belong in SHI. And, and that's not gonna get very far. So, you know, we really, we hope that on the website and things, we've been clear about that, but these kind of interactive sessions can help with making that even clearer. You know, we, we, we're not trying to exclude people. Um, but you just do need to be clear why you've chosen this journal um, and why, you know, it's relevant. Um, another question from Jen. Jen wants to know what are the worst and best parts <laughs> of being an editor? Oh. <laughs> I guess I'd try. Uh, well, the best is just it's, it is a great, a great job. It's great to be involved in the community. It's great to have so many different um, types of work coming through and um, the privilege of reading, um, you know, things that are just so exciting at a very early stage and knowing that we can kind of hold them all the way through to publication and get them in the best um, possible shape. I think that's, that's a real privilege. I think the worst things are, <laughs> oh gosh, <laughs> Should I say it out loud? Um, disgruntled authors, um, very disgruntled authors who perhaps probably shouldn't send that email, I think is probably the worst thing, actually. Um, I think, you know, we're all human behind our screens and sometimes very rarely some authors can forget that there's a human being that their email is being sent to. Uh, but that's, that, that's, just, that, that's really, really rare. Um, yeah, I, I would endorse everything uh, Karen has said and add that, you know, one of the best things to me has been working with a really fab team of people. Yeah, because um, I'm, I'm a real team player. So I, I just love the fact that, you know, I work every day with really interesting, clever, funny people um, who are hardworking and want, want to do the best, you know, for the, for the community. And it's just, um, yeah, it's a real privilege, to be honest, really enjoying it. And those few disgruntled emails really are, you know, we could probably count them on the fingers of one hand um, in the two years that we've been in, in post. So you try to just uh, take the rough with the smooth. Mm -hmm. Another question, uh, Mike Brocker wants to know, um, in the past, uh, SHI has published conversation analytic work. Are there any plans for a specific related project on CA? maybe a special collection or special issue? 
That's a really good idea. Um, I mean, this year we suggested a methods focused monograph and um, that has now um, been agreed and abstracts are in and I would love to see a conversation analysis focused monograph. So thank you very much for the idea. Um, we will discuss it in our team and I'm pretty sure that we will ask for um, that kind of um, proposal in the future. Uh, as Karen was also as Karen was saying earlier in her introduction, if there were if there were a few CA papers that came through around the same time, we would think of pulling those together um, into a special section, um, and perhaps inviting somebody to write an introduction to that as well. So that's another option for having a sort of body of work in in that area published. Okay, um, I can't see any other questions apart from Robert's comment that entitled authors are a real pain. Um, <laughs> um, not at all, not at all. Everyone, yeah, not, yeah, they don't seem to be UK based, if that's reassuring to everybody, they don't seem to, uh, yeah. Um, I don't know if it's reasonable. I mean, what one of the things that, you know, we, we want to learn. So if there are authors and reviewers out there, which clearly there are, um, you know, and we've been asked the question. So to turn it around, you know, what are the what are the best and worst experiences you've had being an author or a reviewer for SHI? Because, we, you know, we're trying to learn as well. So any feedback would be would be very helpful. Shadrach, you're muted. No, I'm back on now. Um, I was going to say, um, I don't seem to have any more. Um, I don't seem to have any more questions um, popped up unless you have last words, both of you to say, and then we can probably take a break before 11.30 for a plenary. We've got last words. Or comments Robin has there. joined us. A rather beautiful Robin has joined us. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's Janice. <laughs> yeah, for the next session, isn't That's it? That's lovely. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, well, thank you. That was really, um, yeah. really helpful session and interesting to hear from people. All right. So on that note, then, um, I would say thank you to both of you for taking time to um, share your experiences, but also your roles at SHI. I bet most people, Sarah says she will write that paper she's been holding back on for a while. Please, Sarah, please uh, do. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you both. Thank you, Karen. And thank Thanks, you. Thank you. Um, Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.